Hi, hello there. Welcome to Protocols and Models. You know the basic components of a simple network, as well as the initial configuration. But after you configured and connected these components, how do you know they will work together? Protocols. Protocols are set of agreed upon rules that have been created by standards organizations. But because you cannot pick up a rule and look at it closely, how do you truly understand why there is such a rule and what it is supposed to do? Models. Models gives you a way to visualize the rules and their place in your network. This module gives you an overview of network protocols and models. You are about to have a much deeper understanding of how networks actually work. So for the module objective, so at the end of this video lecture, you should be able to explain how network protocols enable devices to access local and remote network resources. Also listed here are the topic objectives with their corresponding topic title. So let's get started. So let's start with the rules. Okay, so um, networks vary in size, shape, and function. They can be as complex as devices connected across the internet, or as simple as two computers directly connected to one another with a single cable and anything in between. However, simply having a wired or wireless physical connection between devices is not enough to enable communication. So for communication to occur, devices must know how to communicate. So people exchange ideas using many different communication methods. However, all communication methods have the following three components in common. So these are the sender, the receiver, and the channel or the media. So the message source is the sender. Message sources are people or electronic devices that need to send message to other individuals or devices. So when you say receiver, the message destination, the destination receives the message and interprets it. And the third one is the channel or the media. This consists of the media that provides the pathway over which the message travels from the source to destination so this basically is a wired or wireless all right so let's talk about communication protocols so sending a message whether by face-to-face -face communication or over the network is governed by rules called protocols so these protocols are specific to the type of communication method being used so in our day-to-day -day personal communication, the rules we use to communicate over one medium, like a telephone call, or not necessarily the same as the rules for using another medium, such as sending a letter. The process of sending a letter is similar to communication that occurs in computer networks. So let's take the rule of establishment. So individuals must use established rules or agreements to govern the conversation. So the first message is difficult to read because it is not formatted properly. The second shows the message properly formatted. Okay. So before communicating with one another, individuals must establish rules or agreement to govern the conversation as mentioned earlier. So notice how it is difficult to read the message because it is not formatted properly. It should be written using rules, example protocols, that are necessary for effective communication. The example shows the message, which is now formatted for language and grammar. So if you will observe on the first message here, so it is not properly formatted because if you will observe the very difficult is a single word here. Okay, so to understand is a single word, 
So if it is properly formatted, then we will be able to understand it. Okay, so that is the rule of establishment. We have to specify the rule before we converse or before we initiate a communication. Okay, so protocols must account for the following requirements. An identified sender and receiver, common language and grammar, speed and timing of delivery, and confirmation or acknowledgement requirements. So next is network protocol requirements. The protocols that are used in the network communications share many of these fundamental traits. In addition to identifying the source and destination, computer and network protocols define the details of how a message is transmitted across the network. Common computer protocols includes the following requirements. You've got message encoding, message formatting and encapsulation, message size, timing, and delivery options. Okay, so let us discuss these components or requirements in detail. First is message encoding. So one of the first steps to sending a message is encoding. Encoding is the process of converting information into another acceptable form for transmission. Decoding reverses this process to interpret the information. So let's have the analogy. Okay. So the analogy is to communicate the message. Okay. So maybe we have a, a people communicating here. Okay. So maybe it's a male and a female. Okay, so to communicate the message, she converts her thoughts into an agreed upon language. She then speaks the words using the sounds and inflection of spoken language that convey the message. Her friend listens to the description and decodes the sounds to understand the message he received. Okay, so in the network, in the network, we also have the same. Encoding between hosts must be in appropriate format for the medium. So messages sent across the network are first converted into bits by sending host. Each bit is encoded into a pattern of voltages on copper wires, infrared light in optical fibers or microwaves for wireless systems. So the destination host receives and decodes the signal to interpret the message. Next is message formatting and encapsulation. Okay, so let's have an analogy here. Okay, so you've got the letter, and of course, this is the uh, packet type. Okay, so a common example for requiring the correct format in human communication is when sending a letter. So an envelope has the address of the sender and the receiver, okay? So of course, this one here on the upper left portion is the sender and the receiver is of course at the center of the envelope, okay? So um, an envelope has the address of the sender and the receiver, each located at the proper place of the envelope. So if the destination address and formatting are not correct, the letter is not delivered. The process of placing one message format, the letter, inside another message format, the envelope, is called encapsulation. Okay? The encapsulation occurs when the process is reversed by the recipient and the letter is removed from the envelope. Now, talking about the network, okay? So, similar to sending a letter, a message that is sent over a computer network follow specific format rules for it to be delivered and processed. So the internet protocol or IP is a protocol with similar function to the envelope example. Okay, so on this figure, the fields of the internet protocol version 6. Okay, so for instance, this is an IPv6. All right. And the packet identity or the, the packet is identified by the source of the packet and its destination. So IP is responsible for sending a message 
from the message source to destination over one or more networks. So you've got the source IP address here and the destination IP. So same thing with the letter. You've got the source or the sender and you've got the recipient or the destination. Okay. Next is let's talk about the message size. Okay. So another rule for communicating is the message size. Okay. So let's have an analogy here. Okay. So when people communicate with each other, the messages that they send are usually broken into smaller parts or sentences. So these sentences are limited in size to what is receiving a person can process at one time. Okay. So it also makes it easier for the receiver to read and comprehend. All right. Now in the network, like what you can see here. So when a long message is sent from the host to a destination on the network, it is necessary to break the language or to break the message into smaller pieces as shown on this diagram here. Okay. So we will not be forwarding the entire message as it is, but basically it is broken down into pieces and forwarded it to from the source to destination. Okay. So they can also be different depending on the channel used. Frames that are too long or too short are not delivered. So the size restriction of the frames require the source host to break a long message into individual pieces that meet both the minimum and the maximum size requirements. So the long message will be sent in the separate frames with each frame containing a piece of the original message. Each frame will also have its own addressing information. At the receiving host, the individual pieces of the message are reconstructed into an original message. So that's how it works for the message size. Next is message timing. Okay, so message timing is also very important in network communications. Message timing includes the following. So you've got flow control, response timeout, and access method. So for flow control, this is the process of managing the rate of data transmission. Flow control defines how much information can be sent and the speed at which it can be delivered. For example, if one person speaks too quickly, it may be difficult for the receiver to hear and understand the message. In network communications, there are also network protocols used by the source and destination devices to negotiate and manage the flow of information. Okay, so next is response timeout. So if a person asks a question and does not hear a response within an accept, uh, acceptable amount of time, so the person assumes that no answer is coming and reacts accordingly. Okay, so the person may repeat the question or instead may go on with the conversation. Hosts on the network use network protocols that specify how long to wait for responses and what action to take if a response timeout occurs. So that's response timeout. So the third one is access method. So this determines when someone can send a message. Okay. So likewise, when a device wants to transmit on a wireless LAN, it is necessary for the wireless LAN network interface card or NIC to determine whether the wireless medium is available or not. Okay. So that is access method. So we will be dealing with the access method. Okay. Later in the course. For now, let's move on to the next slide. So the next one is the message delivery options. Okay. So a message can be delivered in different ways. So it could be unicast, multicast, or broadcast. Okay. So let's go back to our analogy. So sometimes a person wants to communicate information to a single individual. At other times, the person may need to send information to a group of people at the same time, or even to all the people in the same area. Okay. 
So, in the network, network communications has similar delivery options to communicate. Okay? So, as shown here in the figure, so you've got unicast, multicast, and broadcast. So, when you say unicast, information is being transmitted to a single end device. Okay? So, it's coming from the source going to a specific destination. This is a one-to-one -one communication. We call it unicast. Okay? So, the next one is multicast. Information is being transmitted to one or more end devices. Okay? Now, in this diagram here, the source is communicating with the two computers on the network. Okay? So, and then the third one is a broadcast. Okay? Broadcast information is being transmitted to all the devices on the network. Okay? Like on this video lecture. Okay? So, this video lecture is a multicast if it is not shared publicly. Okay? So, it, be it is becoming a multicast when there are intended people or audiences only who is authorized to view this video. Okay? And unicast, if I am talking directly to you. Alright? If I am talking to directly to a certain person, we call it unicast. Okay. So, um, how about the rules? A note about the node icon. So, what do we mean by this? Okay. Networking documents and topologies often represent networking and the end devices using a node icon. So, nodes are typically represented as a circle. So, the figure here shows a comparison of the three different delivery options using a node instead of computer icons. So, if you will observe here, on this first diagram here, this is from orange to green. So, we could say that this is a unicast communication. Alright? So, from orange to green, okay, so, but then in that group, there are uh, yellow and green. But the message is intended for the green one. So, therefore, we call it multicast. Okay? So, if we are going to broadcast it to all the green or to all the yellow, we call it broadcast. Alright? Okay. So, let's talk about protocols now. So, protocols are defined earlier as the rules that governs in data communications. You know that for the end devices to be able to communicate over the network, each device must abide by the same set of rules. These rules are called protocols. And they have many functions in a network. So, this topic gives you an overview about network protocols. So, we have a thousands of protocols being used on a network. Okay. All right. So, network protocols define a common format and set of rules for exchanging messages between devices. So, protocols are important or implemented by the end devices and intermediary devices in software, hardware, or both. So, each network protocol has its own function, format, and rules for communications. So, the table here lists various types of protocols that are needed to enable communications across one or more networks. Okay? So, protocols are divided into network communications, network security, routing, and service discovery. When you say network communications, it enables two or more devices to communicate over one or more networks. Okay? There are also called network security protocol. So, secure data to provide authentication, data integrity, and data encryption. We also have protocols for routing. It enables routers to exchange route information, compare path information, and select the best path to get into the destination. Also, we have what's called service discovery, used for the automatic detection of devices or services. Okay, so next is the network protocol functions. So, network communication protocols are responsible for a variety of functions necessary for network communications between end devices. For example, 
in the figure here okay so how does the computer send a message across several network devices to the server so first there is a need for addressing addressing it is used to identify the sender and the receiver okay so addressing identifies the sender and the intended receiver of the message using a defined addressing scheme example of protocols that provide addressing includes ethernet ethernet is the protocol of the local area network and we have different varieties for it okay so ethernet is running at 10 mbps fast ethernet is running at 100 you also have giga ethernet at 1000 you have 10g at 10,000 and you have 100g at 100,000 okay so ethernet you also have ipv4 and ipv6 these are examples of addressing um, function okay so next is reliability this function provides guaranteed delivery mechanism in case messages are lost or corrupted in transit so tcp provides a guaranteed delivery okay so the next one is flow control this function ensures that the data at an efficient rate between two communicating devices tcp provides flow control services so we will be talking about and using these protocols on the succeeding videos that we will have okay so next is sequencing so this function uniquely labels each transmitted segment of data the receiving device uses the sequencing information to reassemble the information correctly this is useful if the data segments are lost okay delayed or received out of order so the tcp provides sequencing services okay next error detection this function is used to determine if data become corrupted during transmission various protocols that provide error detection include ethernet ipv4 ipv6 and tcp okay and the last one is application interface this function contains information used for process to process communications between network applications so for example when accessing a web page http or https protocols are used to communicate between the client and the server web processes okay next how about the protocol interaction okay a message sent from one computer network typically requires the use of several protocol so each one of its own function and format so the figure here shows some common network protocols that are used when a device sends request to a web server for each web page so basically it started with an ethernet which I defined earlier as the protocol of the LAN or the local area network. Okay. And then it goes to the IP, delivers messages globally from the sender to the receiver. And then next is a TCP or the transmission control protocol, which provides guaranteed delivery, manages flow control, and manages the individual conversations. Okay. And then on top is the HTTP or the hypertext transfer protocols which governs the way a web server and web client interact it defines the content and format so basically this protocol here is operating on a different layer and we will be talking about the different layers used in data communications okay so these are the osi layers and you've got the tcp ip model all right okay so let's talk about the protocol switch now so in many cases protocols must be able to work with other protocols 
so that your online experience gives you everything you need for network communications. So the protocol suites are designed to work with each other seamlessly. So a protocol suite is a group of interrelated protocols necessary to perform a communication function. One of the best ways to visualize how the protocols within the suite interact is to view the, inter the interaction as a stack. Okay? A protocol stack shows how the individual protocols within a suite are implemented. The protocols are viewed in terms of layers with its higher level service depending on the functionality defined by the protocols shown on the lower levels. Okay, so the lower layers of the stack are concerned with moving data from the network and providing services to the upper layers, which are focused on the content of the message being sent. Okay, so as illustrated on this figure, we can use layers to describe the activity occurring face-to-face -face communication. Okay, so at the bottom is the physical layer where we have two people with voices saying words. Okay, and then in the middle is what you call the rules layer. Okay, so that stipulates the requirements of communications including a common language, okay, um, the wait for your turn and signal when finished. Okay, at the top is what you call the content layer, and this is where the content of the communication is actually spoken. All right, okay, so um, a protocol suite is a set of protocols that work together to provide a comprehensive network communication services. Since the 1970s, there have been several different protocol suites, some developed by standards organization and others developed by various vendors. Okay, so during the evolution of the network communications and the internet, there were several competing protocol suites as shown in the figure here. Okay, so we have the TCP, IP, the ISO, Apple Talk, and Novel Network. Okay. In the industry nowadays, we are using the TCP IP model having the four layers and the ISO model or the OSI layers having the seven layers. Okay. Okay. So TCP IP protocols are available for the application, transport, and internet layers. So there are no TCP IP protocols in the network access layers. The most common network access layer LAN protocols are the Ethernet and the WLAN or the wireless LAN. Okay, so network access layer protocols are responsible for delivering the IP packet over the physical medium. Okay, now the figure here shows the example of the three TCP IP protocols used to send packets between the web server or the web browser of the host and the web server. So you've got the HTTP or the hypertext transfer protocol, which operates on the application layer. Okay, so HTTP, TCP, and IP are TCP IP protocols used. So at the end of the network access layer, Ethernet is used in the example. However, this could also be a wireless standard such as WLAN or a cellular service. Okay, so for now, if you will observe on this diagram, each of the protocol here operates on a different layer. The Ethernet is operating on the network access. The, yeah, the IP is operating on the internet layer. The TCP is operating on the transport layer and the HTTP is operating on the application layer. So if you will observe on this diagram, there are only four layers used, okay? And this is a TCP IP protocol suite, all right? Okay, so today, the TCP IP protocol suite includes many protocols and continues to evolve to support new services, 
So some of more popular ones are shown on the diagram here. Okay. So these are the protocols used and supported on the TCP IP layers. Okay. So on the application layer, we have what you call the name system or the DNS. Okay. So the DNS or the domain name system translates the main name such as say cisco.com into an IP address or facebook.com into a corresponding IP address. All right. So you also have the host config, which includes the DHCP version 4, version 6, and slab. So these are the protocols used to assign an IP addresses on the workstations. On email, you have SMTP, POP, and IMAP. Okay. SMTP is a single, uh, simple mail transfer protocol. It enables clients to send email to email server and enable servers to send email to other servers. You also have POP3 or POP3, the post office protocol version 3. It enables clients to retrieve email from a mail server and download the email to the client's local mail application. Next is IMAP. IMAP is an internet message access protocol. So it enables clients to access email stored on a mail server as well as maintaining email on the server. Okay, so the next one is a file transfer. For file transfer, we are using protocols like FTP, SFTP, or the SSH file transfer protocol, and the TFTP, or the Trivial File Transfer Protocol. Okay, so for the FTP, these are set of rules that enable the user on one host to access and transfer a file to and from another host over the network. So the FTP is a reliable, connection-oriented, and acknowledged file delivery protocol. So the next one is the SFTP. This is an SSH file transfer protocol, an extension of the secure shell protocol okay so the sftp can be used to establish a secure file transfer session in which the file transfer is encrypted so ssh is a method for a secure remote login that is typically used for accessing the command line of a device next is tftp or the trivial file transfer protocol so a simple connectionless file transfer protocol with best effort and acknowledged file delivery. It uses less overhead than FTP. All right. So next is on the transport layer. Okay. So the transport layer is basically divided into two. You've got connection oriented and connection less. Okay. So when you say connection oriented, we're talking about TCP protocols, transmission control protocol, enables reliable communication between the process running on a separate hosts and provides reliable acknowledged transmission that confirm successful delivery. Okay. So when you say connection less or UDP or the user datagram protocol, this enables a process running on one host to send packets to a process running on another host. Okay. However, UDP does not confirm successful datagram transmission. Okay, so the only difference is this one is reliable. Okay, so for TCP and not reliable or unreliable for UDP. Okay, so next is the internet layer. So for the internet layer, this is divided into three. You've got internet protocols. Uh, messaging and routing protocols okay so for the internet protocol we have the IPv4 which receives message segments from the transport layer packages messages into packets and address packets for an end-to-end -end delivery over a network so IPv4 uses a 32-bit IP addresses 
So for IPv6, this is similar to IPv4, it's just that it uses 128-bit address. All right? So next is the network address translation. So net or network address translation translates an IPv4 address from a private network into a globally unique public IPv4 addresses. Okay? So you also have messaging which includes the ICMP version 4, ICMP version 6, and the ICMP v6 ND. Okay? So ICMP is the internet control message protocol for IPv4. And also for IPv6. And ND is an ICMP version 6 neighbor discovery, which includes the four protocol messages that are used for address resolution and duplicate address detection. Okay, so next is routing protocol. So for the routing protocols, we have a popular OSPF, EIGRP, and BGP. OSPF is an open shortest path first link state routing protocol that uses a hierarchical design based on areas. So OSPF is an open standard interior routing protocol. Okay, so next is EIGRP. EIGRP is Enhanced Interior Gateway Routing Protocol. So this one is an open standard routing protocol developed by Cisco that uses a composite metric on bandwidth delay, load, and reliability. Okay, and the last one is BGP or the Border Gateway Protocol, an open standard exterior gateway routing protocol used between internet service providers or ISPs. BGP is also commonly used between ISPs and their large private clients to exchange routing information. All right. Now let's talk about the protocols on the network access layers. Okay, so these are divided into the address resolution and the data link protocols. So under address resolution, you've got the ARP or the address resolution protocol. So this provides dynamic address mapping between an IPv4 and the hardware address or the MAC address. Okay. Now, next is a data link layer protocol. So you, I guess you are very familiar now with Ethernet. That's what I'm saying and defining earlier. Ethernet is a protocol of the local area network. Okay. It defines the rules for wiring and signaling standards on the network access layer. And the last one is the wireless LAN or the wireless local area network. It defines the rules for wireless signaling across a 2.4 and 5 gigahertz range of frequencies. Okay. So this is for TCP IP. This is an open standard protocol suite that is freely available to public and can be used by any vendor. Okay, so how about the TCP communication process? So, for instance, we have a web server here and you've got a web client. So, a web server encapsulating and sending a web page to a client. Okay, and a client, they encapsulate the web page for the web browser. So, basically, this is our PDU here. Okay, so PDU... Uh, PDU pertains to the data format on a specific layer. Okay, on an Ethernet or layer two, we call it frame or Ethernet frame. Okay, on layer three, we call it IP or IP packet. Okay, on layer four, you you, you call it TCP segment. Okay, and on layer seven, okay, so you've got a user data. Okay. So basically, if we're talking about the TCP IP communication process, this is layer one, Ethernet, network access. IP is the internet layer. Okay. TCP is uh, the transport layer. And data is the application layer. All right. Now let's talk about standards organization okay so when buying a new tires for a car 
there are many manufacturers you might choose. So each of them will have at least one type of tire that fits to your car. Okay? That is because the automotive industry uses standards when they make cars. It is the same with protocols. So because there are many different manufacturers of network components, they must all use the same standards. In networking, standards are developed by international standard organizations. Okay? So open standards encourage interoperability, competition, and innovation. They also guarantee that the product of no single company can monopolize the market and have an unfair advantage over its competition. So a good example is this when purchasing a wireless router, a router for the home, there are many different choices available. Okay, so from a variety of vendors, all of which incorporate standard protocols such as IPv4, IPv6, DHCP, Slack, Ethernet, and wireless. Okay, so this open standard allow a client running the Apple OS X operating system to download a web page from a web server running the Linux operating systems. Okay, so this is because both operating systems implemented the open standard protocols such as those of the TCP IP protocol suite. Okay, so standards organizations are usually vendor neutral. Nonprofit organizations established to develop and promote the concept of open standards. Okay, so these organizations are important in maintaining an open internet with freely accessible specifications and protocols that can be implemented by any vendor. Okay, so a standards organization may draft a set of rules entirely on its own. In other cases, may select a proprietary protocol on the basis of the standard. If a proprietary protocol is used, it usually involves the vendor who created the protocol. Okay, so these are the open standards. If you can name them, okay. This is IEEE, the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. You've got the IANA or the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. So if you want to have a registered IP address, then you go to IANA. Okay. You also have the IETF or the Internet Engineering Task Force. Okay. I can the Internet Corporation for assigned names and numbers. The ITU or the International Trade Union and the TIA or the Telecommunication Industry Alliances. So these are organizations that is responsible for having a standards. Okay. Okay, so various organizations have different responsibilities for promoting and creating standards for the internet and TCP IP protocol. So the figure displays standard organizations involved with the development and support for the internet. So ISOC or the Internet Society, this is an organization with free membership. Okay, so if I were you, I would register with ISOC. So this is an open uh, organization, okay, so with free membership, okay, ISOC or the Internet Society. Now, under this ISOC, you've got the IAB or the Internet Architecture Board. And then in there, you've got the IETF, the Engineering Task Force, and you've got the IRTF, which is responsible for the researches. Okay. So for the Internet standards, so you've got IANA, so registered IP addresses. IP addresses use is regulated by IANA. So together with the domain names and the use of the port numbers, TCP and UDP port numbers. Okay. So ICANN coordinates IP address allocation, the management of domain names and assignment of other information. While IANA oversees and manages IP addresses allocation, domain name management and protocol identifiers for ICANN. So they work hand in hand. To, all, to have an internet standards. Okay. So you also have this IEEE, which I defined earlier. OK, 
okay so let's move on to the next one okay so let's talk about the reference models now okay so you cannot actually watch a real packets across a real network so the way you can watch the components of a car being put together on an assembly line so it helps to have a way of thinking about a network so that you can imagine what is happening so a model is useful in this situation okay so complex concepts such as how a network operates can be difficult to explain and understand. So for this reason, a layered model is used to modularize the operations of a network into a manageable layers. So there are benefits of using a layered model to describe network protocols and operations. So assisting in protocol design because operations or protocols that operate at a specific layer have defined information that they can act upon and defined interface to that layers above and below. So fostering competition because products from different vendors can work together, preventing technology or capability changes in one layer from affecting other layers above and below, providing a common language to describe networking function and capabilities. Now as shown here in the figure, there are two layered models that are used to describe network operations. So you've got the open system interconnection model or reference model, and you've got the TCP IP reference model. Okay, so OSI is from the ISO and TCP IP is from the IEEE. So at the top of the image, there are two LANs connected via wide area network. Okay. So a networking model is used only to represent the network operation. So the model is not the actual network. Underneath are the TCP IP layers and protocols. Now there are seven layers of the OSI model from top to bottom and their associated protocols. So you've got application, presentation, session, transport, network, data link, and physical layer. Okay, now for the TCP IP model, so there are four layers. Okay, so from the top, you've got the applications, you've got the transport, the internet, and the network access. Okay, so basically, the OSI model is a detailed um, model for uh, computer science, IT, okay. So they use OSI model, but for engineers, we use the TCP IP model. So, but then they are the same. Okay. So TCP IP model is more generic, whereas the OSI model is more specific. Okay. Next, let's get into the detail of the OSI reference model. Okay. So the OSI reference model provides an extensive list of functions and services that can occur at each layer. So this type of model provides consistency within all types of network protocols and services by describing what must be done at a particular layer. So but not prescribing how it should be accomplished. Okay. So it also describes the interaction of each layer with the layers directly above and below. So the TCP IP protocol discusses or discussed in this video lecture are structured around both the OSI and the TCP IP models. So the table shows the detail about each layer of the OSI model, the functionality of each layer and the relationship between layers will become more evident throughout the course as the protocols are discussed in more detail. Okay. So basically, you've got the application contains protocols used for process to process communications. You also have the presentation, which provides a common representation of data transferred between application layer services. 
The session layer provides services to the presentation layer and to manage data exchange. The transport layer defines services to segment, transfer, and reassemble the data for individual communications. The network layer provides services to exchange the individual pieces of data over the network and prescribes method for exchanging data frames over a common media for the data link layer. So basically, your physical layer describes the means to activate, maintain, and deactivate physical connections. Okay? Now, talking about the protocol data unit, okay? On the physical layer, the data is represented in terms of bits. All right? On the data link layer, your data is represented in terms of frames. On the network layer, we call it packets. On the transport layer, we call it segment or datagram. And then on the, on the application layer, basically, your data is in a form of applications that is readable and visible to the users. All right. Now, on the TCP IP reference model, the TCP IP protocol model for the internet work communication was created in the early 1970s and is sometimes referred to as the internet model. Okay. So this type of model closely matches the structure of a particular protocol suite. So the TCP IP model is a protocol model because it describes the function that occur at each layer of the protocols within the TCP IP suite. So the TCP IP is also used as a reference model. Okay. Now, the distinct... Um, components of the TCP IP and the OSI model is basically having seven and four respectively. Okay. So on the TCP IP reference model, so it has been four layers where the OSI layer is using the seven layers. Okay. So combining the physical and the data link layer into network access there is no network layer on the TCP IP reference model. We call it internet layer. Okay. So transport has the same name and the application basically is split into application layer, presentation layer, and session layer. Okay. So here's the comparison of the two models. So the protocols that make up the TCP IP protocol suite can also be described in terms of the OSI reference model. So in the OSI reference model, the network access and the application layer of the TCP IP model are further divided to describe discrete functions that must occur at these layers. So at the network access layer, the TCP IP protocol suite does not specify which protocol to use when transmitting over the physical medium. It only describes the half off from the internet layer to the physical network protocols. Whereas the OSI layers 1 and 2 discusses necessary procedures to access the media and the physical means to send data over the network. Okay? Next, let's talk about data encapsulation now. Okay, so knowing the reference model and the TCP IP protocol model will come in handy when you learn about how data is encapsulated as it moves across a network. So it is not as simple as the physical letter being sent through the mail system. Okay, so in theory, a single communication such as a video or an email message with many large attachments could be sent across the network from the source to destination as one massive uninterrupted stream of bits. However, this would create problems for other devices needing to use the same communication channels or links. These large streams of data would result in significant delays. So further, if any link in the interconnected network infrastructure failed during the transmission, the complete message would be lost and would have to be retransmitted in full. 
So a better approach is to divide the data into smaller pieces. We call it segments. Okay? So segmentation is the process of dividing streams of data into smaller units for transmission over the network. So segmentation is necessary because data networks use TCP IP protocol suite send data in individual IP packets. So each packet is sent separately, similar to sending a long letter as a series of individual postcards. Okay? Or packets containing segments for the same destination can be sent over different paths. So this leads to segmenting message having the two primary benefits. Okay? What are these? Increased speed and increases efficiency okay so because a large data stream is segmented into packets large amounts of data can be sent over the network without trying a communications link okay so this allows many different conversations to be interleaved on the network called multiplexing next is increased efficiency if a simple segment or single segment is fails to reach its destination due to failure in the network or network congestion only that segment needs to be retransmitted instead of presenting the entire data stream okay so this is the reason why we need to segment the messages okay now the challenge here is using segmentation and multiplexing to transmit messages across the network is the level of complexity that is added to the process now imagine if you had to send 100 page letter but each envelope could only hold one page okay so therefore 100 envelopes would be required and each envelope would need to be addressed individually okay now having said that it is possible that the 100 page letter in 100 different envelopes arrives out of order, right? So consequently, the information in the envelope would need to include a sequence number to ensure that the receiver could reassemble the pages in the proper order. So in network communications, each segment of the message must go through a similar process to ensure that it gets the correct destination. and it can be reassembled into a content of the original messages. Okay? So TCP is responsible for sequencing and individual sequencing the individual segments. Okay? So remember this, TCP is responsible for sequencing the individual segments because TCP is said to be reliable. All right? Next Let's talk about protocol data units. You, you hear me saying PDUs, okay? So PDUs is basically the data representation on each of the layer. And protocol data units, okay, on the application layer, we simply call it data. And the concept is the data needs to be segmented before forwarding it to the destination, okay? Now, each segment of the data is having their transport header. Now, what's the content with transport header? Well, basically, the, the one of the important component of the transport header is the port address. So, port address pertains to the application's address. Okay? And when encapsulated, we call it segment. Okay? Now, that segment moving further downward, once it reaches the network layer, okay, so apart from the transport layer or the transport header appended on the transport layer, the network layer will append another network header having the source and destination IP address. And when encapsulated, we call it packets. Okay. Now reaching on the second layer. So this is now what you call frame. And the frame has the frame header having the source and destination MAC address. And of course, it, is, it has a trailer. Okay? So you have to remember this protocol data unit on each of the layers. 
Okay, so when messages are being sent on a network, the encapsulation process works from top to bottom. Okay, and at each layer, the upper layer information is considered data within the encapsulated protocol. So, for example, the TCP segment is considered within the IP packet. Okay, now in here, if you'll observe here, your data is there. Okay. And it has this header, TCP, IP, and the Ethernet. So basically, this is now your data transmitted from the web server to the web client and vice versa. Okay? Now, this process is reversed at the receiving host and is known as the encapsulation. Okay? So the encapsulation is the process used by receiving device to remove one or more of the protocol headers, the data is then encapsulated as it moves up stuck towards the user or the end user's application. Okay, so the each of this header will be removed until it reaches the application layer for presentation to the end users. Okay. Next, data access. As you learned, okay, it is necessary to segment messages in a network, but those segmented messages will not go anywhere if they are not addressed properly. Okay, so this topic gives you an overview of network addresses. So you will also get the chance to use other tools. Now, if you are using Wireshark, okay, which will help you view the network traffic. Now, the network and data link layers are responsible for delivering the data from the source device to a destination device. Okay? So, in here, you've got the network layer source and destination address. You've got the data, li data link layer source and destination addresses. Okay? So, basically, on the physical layer, your data is dealt with timing and synchronization of bits. On the data link layer, you've got the destination and source physical address. When you say physical address, this pertains to the MAC address of your computer. Okay? Your network is having the source and destination logical network address. So when you say logical network address, this pertains to the IP address of your computer. Okay? Your transport has this destination and source process number or port addresses. This pertains to the addresses of the applications residing within your computer. So basically, your PDU comprises of several addresses once it traverses from the source to destination or while in transit. Okay? Okay, so um, layer 3 logical address. An IP address is the network layer or layer 3 logical address used to deliver the IP packet from the original source to the final destination. Okay, as shown on this diagram here. Okay, so your IP packet traverses over the network. Okay, so from one router to another and so on. And that is in a form of a PDU called packet. Okay, so the source IP address, the IP address of the sending device, original source of the packet. The destination IP address is the IP address of the receiving device, the final destination of the IP packet. Okay, so the IP address doesn't change while your data moves from the source to destination. Okay, it is fixed. Okay, next. Now, your layer 3 logical address comprises of the network portion and the host portion. Okay? So, basically, when you say network portion, the leftmost part of the address that indicates the network in which the address or the IP address is a member. So, all devices on the same network will have the same network portion of the address. So, we will be dealing with this on IP addressing. 
So for now, you just have to know that your IP address are divided into two. You've got the network portion and the host portion. Okay? So the host portion is the remaining part of the address that identifies the specific device on the network. So this portion is unique for each of the device or interface on the network. Okay? So we will be talking about this once we get onto the IP addressing. But to give you an overview, okay? So the network portion for the source IP address is 192.168.1. This is what you call a network portion. The host portion is 110. Okay. Now, if we're talking about 172.16, okay, so this would depend or vary on the subnet mask. So if we are using the class full addressing, this is class C and this one here is class B. So therefore, the destination IP address 172.16 pertains to the network portion and 1.99 is the host portion. So that's what I'm saying. We will be dealing about this more on the IP addressing on the succeeding video lecture. Okay? So for now, let's move on to the next slide. Okay. So devices on the same network. In this example, we have a computer client. Okay? PC1 communicating with an FTP server on the same IP network. Okay, so the source IP before address of the sending device client is 192.168.1.110. So this is the IP address of this computer sending, and the destination IP address is, of course, the IP address of the FTP server, and that is on 192.168.1.9. So they are on the same network, so that means 192.168.1 is the network portion same thing with this that 110 and that 9 are the host portion okay so when we say that they are on the same network okay so the first three octets in this case are the same they only differ on the fourth octet we call this octet okay so 110 and 9 so they are different components or different computers but they belong to the same network, 192.168.1.0. Okay? Next. Data access rule in the data link layer address. Same IP network. Okay? So earlier on, we used an IP address. Now in here, we use MAC addresses now. Okay? When the sender and the receiver of the IP packet are on the same network, the data link frame is sent directly to the receiving device. On an Ethernet network, the data link addresses are known as the Ethernet Media Access Control or MAC address, or also known as the physical address. So this AAAAA here and the C here, a series of C, are what you call MAC address. Okay, so MAC addresses are physically embedded onto the Ethernet NIC. So the source MAC address, this is the data link address or the Ethernet MAC address of the device that sends the data with an encapsulated IP packet. So the MAC address of the Ethernet for PC1 is a series of A here. Okay, so this uses a hexadecimal notation. And the destination MAC address of the FTP server are all see here again in hexadecimal notation okay so the frame with the encapsulated ip packet can be transmitted from pc1 directly to the ftp server okay that's the communication on the data link layer okay on the data link layer your devices uses mac address on the network layer your devices uses an ip address Okay, so how about devices on a remote network? Okay, so um, for instance, okay, we have here a source which is located on 192.168.1.10 and our destination, for instance, is a web server at 172.16.1.99. Okay, 
So, the consideration here is slash 24. Okay? So, having slash 24, that means the subnet mask is 255.255.255.0. That means the first three octet corresponds to the network ID and the last octet corresponds to the host. So you've got the network ho the network portion and you've got the host portion here. Okay. So what happens when the actual or ultimate destination is not on the same LAN and it is remote? So basically, if your computer is communicating on a remote device okay so your switch will basically examine the packet and if it is not on the same network it will be forwarded onto the default gateway okay that's the sense of the default gateway whenever we communicate with the other devices or other computers on the other network your default gateway is being used okay now, what happens when PC1 tries to reach the web server? So, that's what I'm saying. If the destination is not on the same network, okay, so therefore, it will be forwarded onto the default gateway. Okay? And therefore, your data will communicate on the network layer, okay? And then once it reaches on the destination, it will go back to layer 2 and then forwarding it to the web server using the MAC address. Okay? So, IP addresses are being used by routers. Okay? Whereas, MAC addresses are being used by switches. So, how come the switch can communicate with the router? So, remember that we have the protocol called ARP. Okay? The ARP is a protocol responsible for mapping the MAC address into its corresponding IP address. Okay? So, that makes sense here. But, We'll get into the details of moving data from the source to destination as we progress as with the course. So for now, let's put it that way. MAC address is on the layer 2 and it is usually used by the switch. And your IP address or layer 2 addresses are usually being used by the routers. All right? Okay, so what is the role of the network layer addresses? So when the sender of the packet is on a different network from the receiver, the source and destination IP address will represent hosts on a different network. So this will indicate or this will be indicated by the network portion of the address. Okay, and the destination host. So in this example, the source IP address is 192.168.1.10. Okay, this is the source. And the destination, take a look at it, it's 172.16.1.99, which is located on the other network. Okay? So, notice that in the figure, that the network portion of the source IPv4 address and the destination address are on different networks. Okay? So, in here, you've got 192.168.1.10, and in there, you've got 172.16.1.99. So they are on a different network. All right. Next, the role of the data link layer, okay, or data link layer addresses in a different IP network. So when the receiver or when the sender and the receiver of the IP packet are on different network, the Ethernet data link frame cannot be sent directly to the destination because the host is not directly reachable. Okay. So the Ethernet frame must be sent to another device known as the router or the default gateway, which I mentioned earlier. Okay. So in our example, the default gateway of PC1 is the interface of R1, which is 192.168.1.1. So again, the switch should know that the destination is not on the same network. Okay. So therefore, it will be forwarded onto the R1's default gateway so that it can be forwarded by R1 to another directly connected routers to it until it reaches the destination. Alright? Okay. So, the MAC address, in this case, the source MAC address is AAA and then the destination's MAC address is 
11, 11, 11, 11. Now, as your data moves from the source to destination, the IP address is fixed. The source IP address is fixed. The destination IP address is fixed. Okay? But it is different in the case of the data link layer or the MAC, uh, MAC addresses. Okay? So basically, every HAPS, your MAC address changes. Okay? So for instance, on this HAP, from PC1 going to the default gateway, okay, the source MAC address is the MAC address of PC1 and the destination MAC address is the MAC address of the R1's uh, interface, this interface specifically. Okay? So once it moves the data from the source to another hub, your MAC address source and destination changes. So basically, if we already have reached this area here from R2 going to the web server, the source MAC address is the MAC address of this router here, which in this case which is 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, 22, okay? And the destination MAC address is the A, B, C, D, E, F, 12, 34, and 56. So that's how it works, okay? Next, data link layer addresses. So the data link layer 2 physical address has a different role. The purpose of the data link layer address is to deliver the data from one network interface to another network interface on the same network. Okay, that's the use of the MAC address. If the source and destination are on the same network, then we just have to use the MAC address. All right. So before an IP packet can be sent over a wired or wireless network, it must be encapsulated in a data link frame so it can be transmitted over the physical medium. Okay, so next. Okay, so as the packet travels from host to router, router to router, and finally router to host, at each point along the way, the IP packet is encapsulated in a new data link frame. So each data link frame contains the source data link address of the NIC card sending the frame and the destination data link address of the NIC card of the receiving frame. Okay, so that's what I explained earlier. What every HAPS, your MAC address changes. All right. Okay, so take a look at here. Okay, so on this area here from the source going to the first router, okay, your source MAC address is basically the MAC address of the computer and the destination MAC address is the MAC address of this router's interface connected to uh, PC1. This is the first step. Now on the next hub, the source MAC address is in here and the destination MAC address is in there. And on the last half, source MAC address is on the router and the destination MAC address is on the server. Okay? So basically your data has this layer 2 and layer 3 headers. So your layer 2 header contains the source and destination MAC addresses and then your layer 3 header contains the source IP address and the destination IP address. Okay? So, as mentioned earlier, notice that the packet is not modified, but the frame is changed. Therefore, the layer 3 IP addressing does not change from segment to segment like the layer 2 MAC addressing. So the layer 2 addressing remains the same since it is global and the ultimate destination is still the web server. Okay, now to sum up this um, presentation, on this video lecture, we talked about the different uh, layers of the OSI model and the TCP IP model. And we also talked about the PDUs, the protocol data units. Okay, so for each of the layer, and the difference between MAC address and IP address, okay? And the transmission of data on the same network and going to a different network. 